Hello everyone and welcome to the talk about how IntelliJ IDEA supports Scala. My name is Maciej, I'm a product marketing manager at JetBrains in the IntelliJ Scala plugin team. This talk will be an update on what my team has been working on since around 2019. The date is set because in 2019 one of our developers gave a talk like this at Scala Days so while preparing this one, I thought it would be a reasonable cutoff date. But I would like to start with some statistics. Every year, JetBrains conducts a developer's ecosystem survey. This year, we got more than 1,300 responses from Scala developers, much more than in previous years. Such participation lets us confidently speak about how vital our work is to the Scala community and about our strengths and weaknesses. We made efforts to reach a diverse crowd of developers working in all kinds of companies and open source projects, as well as students and self-educated junior developers. 77% of them responded that they use IntelliJ IDEA with the Scala plugin as their primary IDE. Moreover, among the remaining 23%, a bit more than half use IntelliJ IDEA with the Scala plugin as a secondary one, most likely for hobby projects or for learning. It's a lot. It's a lot in the numbers, but also in the sense of responsibility that we, the Scala team at JetBrains, feel on our shoulders. We are happy that you like our work and, well, we will keep working to bring you the best Scala development experience. So what is this work exactly? The Scala support in IntelliJ IDEA consists of many parts. The first thing people notice when they launch IntelliJ is, of course, that they can create a new project or open an existing one. IntelliJ will set it up if it's the former or read in its configuration from SVT or another built tool configuration file if it's the latter. Then it will parse, index and highlight the code, letting you know about errors and suspicious places, offer hints, inspections and fixes, show you how different parts depend on each other and so on. But that's not all, far from it. Among other things, we also support various Scala frameworks and test libraries. Recently, we modernized our user interface, and I want to say a few words about that too. There's a debugger with a bunch of features that may help you. When you compile a project, we can show you how much time is spent on what in the form of compilation charts. On the side of hints and inspections, there's one exciting thing about SBT I would like to show you. And yes, of course, we have many more of inspections to help you edit your code. Then, closer to the end, I will discuss our work on Scala 3 support. And finally, I'd like to present a new experimental feature, AI Assistant. But first, Frameworks and libraries. The main focus of IntelliJ Scala support is, of course, Scala itself. We parse the syntax and run inspections. In all that, we stay agnostic regarding what your code is doing. You write a web server, a data processing library, an end user application, no matter. The Scala support in IntelliJ will work the same for you. But there are some frameworks and libraries. I'm mostly thinking about play framework and some test frameworks you can see on the screen here. These are libraries that are popular enough that it makes sense to give them special attention. For example, we support play by implementing additional inspections that understand how play applications work. And so, just as we can run inspections on your standard Scala code, we can run additional inspections on your play code. For example, we can warn you about routing URL clashes or that a resource is missing. Similarly, we support various test frameworks. Since we know that, obviously, you use a test framework to write and execute tests, we can provide you with some additional functionality, like a way to run them from within IntelliJ IDEA, one by one or in groups, 
or with some specific configuration applied. Then we can let you see the results of those tests in ways that make it easier to spot the problem if the test fails. However, supporting third-party frameworks and libraries takes time and effort. They are usually in constant development. In our work, we rely on the fact that we understand how they work, but the way they work changes with time. And when it changes, our support for them breaks down and we need to fix it. That's why we are often reluctant to implement such specific support directly in the IntelliJ Scala plugin. Instead, the IntelliJ platform enables developers to write separate, smaller plugins that rely on bigger ones. These smaller plugins can support a given framework and augment our functionality this way, while if something changes in the supported framework or library, it's easier to respond to that change in a small plugin than in a big one. For example, that's the case with the Zio support. There are the Zio IntelliJ plugin and the Zio IntelliJ test plugin, both written and maintained by Igal Tabacznik. They rely on the IntelliJ Scala plugin and add some inspections specific to Zio. You can find them on JetBrains Marketplace. Now the new user interface. As JetBrains, we don't give you only the Scala support as if in a void. We offer you a whole IDE. Many people work on its many features and many of those features are language agnostic. Uh, you may code in Scala, your colleague may work in Kotlin or someone else you know uses Java and every day, all three of you will use the same IntelliJ IDEA functionality, be it keyboard shortcuts, build and run configuration windows, or the UI. Fairly recently, our colleagues in JetBrains updated the UI. We now have different background colors for different levels of menus. We have more space to separate different areas on the screen. We have something called the sizes hierarchy, meaning that more important icons and buttons should be more prominent than others. And the icons in the UI are now outlined instead of fully painted matching the current trends. If you want, you can go back to the old UI. There's a checkbox for that in the settings, but I think the new one is really nice. Next thing, the debugger. Here's an example unit test. It doesn't really test anything. It's only here to show how IntelliJ Scala supports debugging. We run the test in the debug mode. It stops at this line. Now, on the bottom left, you can see a stack trace. We can click on every line and open methods code. These are the methods that consequently call the one we are currently in. We can even see the code in a third party library, MEUnit in this case. And on the bottom right, you can see the current values of fields in the scope of a given method. Here in the unit test, we have a list, a map, and a lazy list. For the list and the map, we can already see their sizes. If we click on them, we unroll the elements they consist of. In the case of a map, elements are tuples, so that's why they are listed like that. We also have access to the this field and what's in it. A lazy list is a bit of a special case. We only know its contents once it's evaluated. In theory, the lazy list can be infinite. That's why first we see the question mark as its size, but when we click on it, IntelliJ Scala will evaluate the first 10 elements and show them to us. And then you can click again and see 10 more elements of that lazy list. By the way, you can do exactly the same thing in the editor. You can see that we displayed so-called inline hints, more about them later. You can see the size of the list in the inline hints, the size of the map, and also the lazy list. There are arrows next to them. When you click the arrow, you will see a pop-up with the same information about the contents as in the bottom right window. Compilation charts. So imagine you have a big project so big and complicated that it takes several minutes to compile it. 
as big as, let's say, IntelliJ Scala plugin itself. As is typical for big products, IntelliJ Scala plugin is divided into modules. Each of those modules is compiled in phases. Some modules can be compiled in parallel, while others need to wait for yet other modules to be compiled first. All that is described in SBT configuration files. IntelliJ Scala can read those files, and when you click Compile, it can use the information to show you this nice compilation chart. By default, it only shows what modules are being compiled, but we can also switch and see phases. This way, by following the compilation process, we can identify modules and phases that take extra long, which might mean that the total compilation time will go down if we work on them. Or, of course, it may turn out that there's not much that can be done. The compilation chart might show you that everything works more or less optimized, and all you can do is take a break, make yourself a coffee, or uh, practice fencing. I felt obliged to display this XKCD comic, and I looked very hard for an excuse. This is the best I came up with. While we are still talking about SBT, there is one excellent inspection I'd like to tell you about. Let's go back to the example project, but this time let's open the build SBT file. The only dependency I need in the examples is a unit, but let's say I want to add another one. Let's say chimney from Scala land. Sometimes dependencies can have quite long group IDs and artifact IDs. One way to deal with that is to go to GitHub or Maven Central and look for how to add that dependency. But there's another way. I can start writing chimney, and here it is. IntelliJ Scala made a query to a dependencies repository and came back with out completion for chimney. And look, the same happens to the version number. I must warn you though that this is not a perfect feature. Sometimes the inspection gets confused and is unable to find what we want. But anyway, it's worth to give it a try. There are, of course, many other inspections. Some of them are pretty straightforward. They will show you that some code is unused, like here, or used but only within the current scope, so that a declaration can be private, like here. We have a lot of inspections working on collections as well. They can show you hints on how to write more performant code. For example, that filter and head option can be replaced with find, filter and contains on sets can be replaced with interfect, that it's better to filter first and sort later, and so on and so on. When you work with options and check for them uh, for being some or none, we can highlight problems in your code and sometimes show you a better solution. If else here can be replaced with filter, map plus get or else false can become either exists or fault, or if it's map and get or else true, it might be for all. In the case of monadic transformations, there is an inspection to warn you if you attempt a side effect inside a transformation, which may be what you want, but it might also be a mistake. And here, okay, I know future is not really a monad, but for the sake of this example, let's pretend it is. It's a monad with a mutable state inside. And we have an inspection that warns you if you put a monad like that inside another monad, because you should be careful around those things. Another way inspections can be helpful is, for example, auto-import. Let's delete the imports I already have here. And yeah, this code is red now because it needed those imports not only directly, but also for implicit it uses. So let's now import it all back with a few clicks here and here and here. Okay, done. Now let's go back to the topic of inlay hints. I showed you them before uh, together with the debugger, but there's more about them. In the idea, allows for displaying useful information directly in the editor 
next to the code in the form of inlay hints. That is text, which is usually of a different color, font or style, so that it's not mistaken for the actual code. But it's similar enough to be effortlessly read together with the code. You can think of it as augmented code, like augmented reality. You can see the line numbers, inferred result types, parameter names, indentation guides, and method separators. All that info doesn't have to be typed explicitly in the Scala code, which is good because the code can be more concise. But on the other hand, if you read it for the first time, you might have trouble understanding what's going on. In such cases, inlay hints can improve readability and greatly help the developer. But such functionality comes at a price. Readability is a subjective issue, and instead of appreciating the help, you may feel that the editor is now too crowded and cluttered with unnecessary text. If you're an experienced developer working on the code you already know, you may find little need for all that additional information displayed on the screen. So you decide to turn it off, and rightfully so. But it may happen, after you do it, that your work takes you to a place you don't know so well. And now additional information displayed directly in the editor could be helpful again. So you need to go to settings and re-enable it. The constant switching between too little and too much information displayed on the screen and the fact that disabling and re-enabling the hints snaps the developer out of the coding flow is a problem we know very well in IntelliJ IDEA. The X-Ray feature is our attempt to remedy that. With X-Ray, you can keep inlay hints and all the other additional information disabled or only partially enabled to the point where you feel comfortable and then press down the control or command button two times and hold it. All the other hints will appear and will be displayed only for the length of time you keep control command key down. Oh, and uh, just a quick note about one more thing. Scala doc pop-ups got updated recently. Now, if a class implements many traits, you will see them in separate lines. Also, you can click on each one as well as on their types or annotations and on the package. In all cases, it will switch the contents of the Scala doc pop-up to the documentation about the element you clicked. Moving forward to the Scala free support, Starting in 2020, even before Scala 3 was actually released, the IntelliJ Scala team worked on it already. We added preliminary support in 2021 release, and in virtually every release since then, we added more features, worked on eliminating invalid red code, fixed corner cases that were left out in support added in previous releases, and so on and so on. There are three uh, releases of IntelliJ IDEA uh, and the Scala plugin every year, and we have a blog where we publish release notes every time. I will show you a link to it at the end. You can go there and read it all in detail. You will see that with every blog note, Scala free support is at the top, and the update about it often covers a significant portion of the whole note. Finally, the AI Assistant. It's still in heavy development, so how it works may change a bit in time. For now, I can show you that I can click right on the method or select some code portion, then choose AI Actions, and here it is. AI can attempt to write the documentation for the given method, it can try to explain it to me, look for possible risks and errors, or it can give me some hints about its refactoring. It works as a well, a code reviewer or another programmer working with you in a pair. It may help if you ask how a call to a popular third-party library works, and the answer will be helpful because AI know that library. But if you give it just a snippet of code without much context, it will just make a wild guess what it does. That being said, I think, for example, that the find problems action is very useful. When I code, I often focus on the happy path. It's good to have something to remind me uh, in what ways my code may fail. 
Also, as you can see here, we can edit user prompt. Currently, the AI we use is GPT, so the prompt is simply text composed from the code we give to it and the question we make. You can replace the question with whatever you like and save it under a new AI action. Please note that to be able to give you an answer, your code needs to be sent to OpenAI. Be careful about it. Even if technically nothing wrong can happen, ensure you are legally allowed to do that. In the future, JetBrains plans to diversify and have different AI models and have them on-premise as well. Anyway, if you, like me, mostly work from home or your coworkers work remotely while you sit alone in the office, you may use another of IntelliJ Ideas features, Code With Me. I will not turn it on now because I have nobody to code with right now, but if you have, then Code With Me is a way to work together on the same code and talk to each other while you do it. You can find out more here on the Code With Me webpage. And since talking to each other is so important, I have a favor to ask you. Your feedback drives a lot of our work in the IntelliJ Scala team. We have our backlog of issues, of course, both bugs to fix and new features to do, but it is crucial for us to get your opinion on how things work. Do you like the updates in the latest release? What do you wait for the most? And so on. If you have a feature request or a bug report, you can go to help and submit feedback. You can also go to utrack, um, our ticket tracking system, and create a new ticket for us. But before you do it, please browse through all the tickets first. It is possible that someone already reported the same or similar issue, or maybe you will find a resolved ticket, or if not, then perhaps a temporary workaround. On the other hand, you can always find us on social media and just ask. We have our own Discord server. We are also active on the platform formerly known as Twitter. And yeah, again, you can check our blog. Thank you and happy developing.